Welcome to NFL Live, presented by Xbox. One third of the playoff picture is now complete. Broncos have won the West. The Falcons have won the NFC South. The AFC East for the ninth time in 10 years belongs to the New England Patriots and the Houston Texans have indeed clinched a playoff spot. The Falcons, of course, clinched the NFC South. They got that started with their win Thursday night. For the ninth time in 10 years, Tom Brady and company rule the AFC East. They did it with a 23-16 win at the Miami Dolphins. The Denver Broncos took care of business at home. First time they have had back-to-back -back AFC West crowns since, get this, 1986 and 1987. They did it, 31-23 over Tampa Bay. And the Texans are tied for the best record in football, but they still haven't clinched their division. They do have a playoff spot, though, with a 24-10 win on the road at Tennessee. And with that, we welcome you into another edition of NFL Live. Glad to have you with us. Trey Wingo here with Tim Hasselbeck and the coach, Eric Mangini. And we've got coaching news to discuss. We'll get to the Monday night game, but has the Michael Vick era closed out in Philadelphia. Eagles head coach Andy Reid announcing on Monday that the Eagles will ride with rookie quarterback Nick Foles as the starter for the rest of the season. Michael Vick still dealing with concussion issues and the Eagles have now lost eight straight games. I think where we're at right now in the season, I think that's a, it gives us kid an opportunity to, to play and finish it up. And uh, um, I just think it's a, you know, he's playing well enough, number one, to where I think he can win football games for us. And then two, I think where we sit in this, at this position in the season, I, I think it's a, it's the right thing to do. Uh, this was a move that I made. Nobody else made this move. Uh, and that's important for you to understand. And um, this isn't a move to save my job. That's not what that is. Uh, this is a move that I think uh, needed to be done now, and, uh, and so I did it now. Well, in the last four games played by Vic and Foles, they've roughly completed the same percentage of passes. Foles, however, nowhere near the running threat uh, that Michael Vick has, or is. He's rushed only twice in four games for zero net yards. Okay, there are all kinds of permutations, guys, here with, with this decision. And a lot of it, Eric, is based on the contract that Michael Vick signed just last year. Uh, and the issue becomes this. Michael Vick is due a $3 million bonus if he's on the roster three days after the Super Bowl. But if he's not on the roster, he counts $0 toward the 2013 salary cap for the Philadelphia Eagles. Has he played his last game? Well, I think that what we're going to find out now with Nick Foles finishing out the season is where he is. And, and that's an important thing. And I respect Andy for doing this because it's not about saving his job. It's about making the right decision for the organization. And that's finding out where the young quarterback is. If he's good enough, then it's probably over for Michael Vick. If he's not, then you have the option to go back to Michael Vick or maintain the services. And if, if you don't have a better alternative, I think you might have to make that decision. But I don't think there's any way that they go back to Michael Vick without asking Michael Vick to make a lot less money, maybe push back that $3 million you know, bonus that he's due three days after the Super Bowl. And I think this is a clear indication that Andy would say, hey, let's look at a young player. Let's see what he can do at the end of this season, see if he can improve and see if he looks like he can be the guy going forward. Because even though Michael Vick is injured right now, the truth is when you go back and you evaluate him at the end of the season and watch him play early on, he was not playing well. He was right. not living up to the contract that he signed, not playing at that type of level. So something was going to have to be done with Michael Vick, his contract, and his future as the Eagles quarterback. And look, Nick Foles has not won the last two games, but he's actually played pretty well. He didn't have the turnovers in the game against the Panthers or Sunday night against the Cowboys. Also that not was running back. defense either. Yeah. You know, so in terms of wins and losses, I think it's more about just evaluating him as a quarterback operating in the National Football but, League. But that's not the, the actions of a, of a coach who's thinking short term. That's the right thing for this organization. Mm -hmm. And I really respect Andy for doing that and, and because it, it makes a lot of sense. And now they can make an informed decision on, on Michael Vick. 
And we'll see how it plays out for the rest of the season. As for the other two teams in the NFC East, they get it going tonight on ESPN's Monday Night Football. Skins hosting the Giants. Now it was week seven at MetLife at Met Stadium when RG3 hit Santana Moss for what appeared to be a game-winning touchdown pass uh, in the fourth quarter. Only then to see Eli Manning and Victor Cruz on a 77-yard touchdown to actually win the game. It is the rematch tonight. This one in D.C. Time for a DirecTV team report. And for that, we say, hey, Lisa Salters. Hey, Trey. Well, at the very top of the Giants' to-do list tonight, contain Robert Griffin III. The Giants' first up-close look at Griffin came back in October, a game they barely won in which Griffin racked up 347 total yards, including 89 rushing. Safety Antrell Roll says Griffin is definitely the fastest quarterback he's ever faced, with the exception of maybe Michael Vick. The Giants used backup quarterback David Carr and second-year wide receiver Jarrell Jernigan to try to simulate Griffin in practice this week. But defensive coordinator Perry Fuel said trying to simulate that in practice, there's no way. He's a rare talent. Justin Tuck has been telling his quarterback Eli Manning that perhaps his offense Offense can be the best defense on Griffin. Get them chasing points, said Tuck. That's not where they want to be. In passing situations where we feel confident and we can dial up the blitzes and let the front four eat. Trey? All right, Lisa, thanks. Uh, listen, after the win by the Giants earlier this year, Justin Tuck got up there and said RG3 takes away from his enthusiasm for the game because <laughs> he's so hard to defend. I don't know if you could give a quarterback more of a compliment than that. With that in mind, what might we see the second time around from the Giants trying to defend RG? Well, I think you're going to see a defense, especially a front, that's going to respect his speed a little bit more. You look at some of the angles that they took on him first time around. It, they underestimated how fast this guy was. I think you're also going to see a defense that responds better to some of the different formations that the Washington Redskins decide to use. Kind of non-typical NFL formations. Uh, which doesn't always make you defend the entire field, but there's a lot that the Redskins do off of that. I think we will see them come after him a little bit more, trying to get secondary blitzes involved in terms of stopping the design quarterback runs. I also think you'll find other ways to just defend him as a design runner, but also keep him in the pocket as much as they can as a passer. What I'm really excited to see is this is the first time RG3 has faced an opponent for the second time, yeah. and the starting point is so much different now because you can you know the personnel, you understand their scheme, and they can do more with him. So now how he responds in this first view of a second opponent, I think is going to be great to watch. Well, it'll be interesting to see because we saw what happened when the Rams actually had a second look at Colin Kaepernick. We'll see what happens the second time around here. Again, RG3 has been great the last two games, four touchdown passes. A rookie has never done that before. Meanwhile, some 24 hours after the unspeakable crime that left a child orphan and two people dead, the Kansas City Chiefs took the field Sunday at home against the Carolina Panthers, knowing that one of their own, linebacker Javon Belcher, had killed his girlfriend, Cassandra Perkins, the mother of his daughter, before taking his own life in the Chiefs' parking lot Saturday morning in front of head coach Romeo Cornell and general manager Scott Pioli. Chief players were trying to find the strength to play the game, as tight end Kevin Boss tweeted before kickoff. The Chiefs found that strength and played well, winning 27-21 for their second victory of the season. It was not an easy day for anyone involved in the Chiefs organization, and this is what Romeo Cornell said to his team in the locker after the game. We came a lot. We stuck together as a team like we talked about, helped each other, all right? Family and friends, you relied on those people, all right? You relied on your faith to help get you through this, all right? And we got through it, all right, in a, in a grand way because everybody made a contribution. Everybody helped, okay? And that's what a team is about. That's what a team is about. You did a very nice job with that, all right? And the win was a really good win. Javon Belcher was in his fourth year in the NFL. Cassandra Perkins was just 22 and hoping to be a teacher. Starting quarterback Brady Quinn said playing the game and grieving together for all involved was better than not playing and sitting idly with their own thoughts. Romeo Cornell today on the decision to play the game. I think playing the game helped. I think it really did. It took our minds off our sorrow um, and put the focus on the field for a couple hours. Uh, and the outcome of the game, I think that helped us even more. It's hard to prepare and play under the circumstances that we had to had to play under, but my hats are off to those guys for being able to to pull it together and, and to go out and, and and basically play for each other and, and and help win the game. We know that we have to 
have to deal with the events of the last few days, and, and it's not over, and it might not be over for, uh, for some of us for most of our lives. Uh, but time heals all wounds, and so uh, we're going to start working on the time thing and trying to focus on our next task, which is the Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. Well, that, that's the nature of the business. This happens, you move on, and then you play the next game. Romeo Cornell said it uh, earlier. He said, we're football players, Eric. We coach, we play on Sundays. That's what they did. You know Romeo Cornell very well from your time together in New England. How do you think he's handling not only what he saw in that parking lot Saturday, but how he has to handle that and deal with his team? Yeah, I can't imagine what Romeo's going through. I, I really can't. And uh, what I do know about Romeo is I wouldn't want to have anybody else besides a, a man like him it, it, to, to be a leader of a, of a team for something this difficult because he, uh, he's like a father figure and he's got an incredible empathy for, for people and, and uh, just a great understanding of, of how to deal with, with tough situations. Uh, there's, no, there's no blueprint for, for dealing with a tragedy like this, but I know the type of man he is and the type of person he is, um, you'd want that for your team. I've known Romeo since I was a teenager, and, and it's an excellent description of him. He's a special guy, and you can tell by the way that he handled that for that football team. And, you know, he made a, co a comment about coaches coach and players play on Sundays, and uh, I think the team, uh, I think they needed that. I, I do. I think, I, like you, I can't imagine what any of them are going through, what the, what's going through their minds. But playing, and I'm sure coaching, is a relief for some people in terms of how you grieve. There was a lot of hugs and a lot of love going around for the guys in Kansas City Chiefs uniforms on Sunday. Um, and I think that was important for those guys. Again, the real issue may be the off season when there is this time to try and try and process all this information of, of what, the, what they saw and, and the person that they thought they knew in one of their teammates. And that is why the NFL and the Chiefs have set up grief counselors for anybody involved. Chief players, by the way, have also set up a fund for three-month-old Zoe Belcher. But as offensive tackle Eric Winston said, money can only do so much. Stay with us. We're coming back. Monday Night Football live on ESPN America. In week 13, we're off to the Capitol to see two superstar quarterbacks collide. Manning leaves his Giants on the road and hopes to keep their playoff dreams alive but they'll have to overcome the remarkable rookie RG3 and his hard-hitting defense. Giants at Redskins. It all starts tonight at midnight 30 CET with Monday Night Countdown. Monday Night Football live on ESPN America, home of the NFL. It was perfect throw. Perfect throw. Uh, a plus. You have a grade for that? It's an F. I'll alert the media on that one. Go see if you can find a dope for buying. Yes. Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. Just stop talking. How does it make sense for the Redskins to draft Kirk Cousins? <laughs> RG1? Let's just say I left a little present in Al Leiter's oh, shoe. Oh. Don't miss Pardon the Interruption. Weekdays on ESPN America. But Coach and Alex, you know, just the way to just kind of loosen them up a little bit. You know, whatever it takes to get Alex pumped up. Whatever floats his boat. Funny saying it like Alex going out there to lay a hit or, or, or lay a block on somebody. I'm sure Alex has uh, gotten immune to it. Hey, they can keep doing it. I guess it's working. NFL Live is presented by Xbox. This holiday, get an Xbox 360 with Connect and three games, now $50 off. And in part by the Lincoln Motor Company and the new 2013 MKZ. McElroy, play action, rolling to his right at the 
five, flips it, end zone, wide open, Cumberland, touchdown! The first touchdown pass of Greg McElroy's career gives the Jets the lead. And there it was, the offense for the Jets. Mark Sanchez relegated to holding the clipboard because he was picked off three times before he got benched in the third quarter. Sanchez watched as Greg McElroy led them to the win. So what happens now, Rex Ryan? I definitely, you know, need uh, a little more time to make that decision. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable and confident with, with all three quarterbacks. I think all three guys, well now, you know, have proven they can win in this league with Greg uh, at the end of the game. And then obviously uh, Mark's history here and uh, the way Tim has played. So you have three guys that I'm confident in, uh, but as you know, I'll make that decision as the week goes on. All right, they got to make that decision sometime before they play the Jacksonville Jaguars. Eric Mangini, Mark Sanchez, has struggled. He's had multiple turnovers in eight of his last ten games. Greg McElroy came in and did what he could not do in that game, throw a touchdown pass, and Tim Tebow? Tim Tebow's Tim Tebow. <laughs> and a lot of people want Tim Tebow in New York. And, oh, by the way, the game is in Jacksonville where Tim Tebow is from. Where do the Jets go? Well, you're not worried about where the game is or what the Jacksonville fan wants, what fans want. I think what you got to look at here is Matt Ryan struggled against Arizona's defense. Tom Brady struggled against Arizona's defense. And I'm not defending Mark Sanchez's game, but I think that, that the situation is um, they believe that he gives them the best chance to win. Mm -hmm. And they've got very winnable games here down the stretch. And when you make a decision like this on a quarterback you've invested so much in, it's, it's a bigger decision just than just to who to start and who not to start. Yeah, and I think in terms of who they believe gives them the best chance to win, that's why he's maintained the starting position for so long. And I think when you look at this, making the move to Greg McElroy, that'd be a big jump. Greg McElroy has been their third guy. Their third guy for a reason. Um, listen, if, you're, if your backup was healthy, maybe it's a different conversation. I think the right thing to do if you're Rex Ryan is, is give Mark Sanchez another opportunity to be the starting quarterback. And, and you've never pulled him before. This is the first time he's been pulled from a game. So see how he responds to that. You can always go back to McElroy, you know, if you get in the situation that you were in last week. I just think that, that this isn't the time with the games that they have in there, front there, of them. There was a time a couple of years ago where Rex openly said, I thought about pulling Mark Sanchez and tried to get that ploy together. It's a little bit away. different thinking about it and yeah. having it actually yeah. happen. Look, the, the bottom line is that they made that commitment to him. If you look at that contract, that commitment is not that ironclad. Well, there's, not sure of, that yeah, there's not a lot of yeah. Not a lot of guaranteed money in that contract yeah, extension they got. It's eight million dollars, but they they've shown that they firmly feel that he he can be the guy, and maybe they feel if they add some more pieces and, and can have a better offseason, he can get back to that AFC Championship form that he that he showed at one point. Again, they have winnable games. Uh, there may be questions whether or not he's the guy. There is no question who the guy is in Indianapolis. That is loud and clear. It is Andrew Luck as he did it again Sunday in Detroit with another fourth quarter comeback slash game winning drive. Let's go to the fourth quarter. It's 33 21 Luck feeling the pressure. Tim that's what's so impressive that move to find Levon Brazil. Yeah and not just that ability but then also the physical ability to get the ball down the field the strength in the pocket it's just outstanding. 33 to 28 it's third and one so of course I'm just gonna throw a perfect pass to Reggie Wayne. <laughs> Come on. Over two guys. That is crazy. Guy. And then here you know a lot of rookies T.Y. Hilton Dwayne Allen also stepping up here and getting out of bounds. So now it's the last play of the game. And boy, you have to make the right call here to throw it to the nine to let Donnie Avery scamper in with the win. And that's exactly what happened. And look at how accurate he is with the ball that lets Avery maintain his speed and get into the end zone. That's why that works. And the awareness of the line of scrimmage. Exactly. 35-33 the final score. Andrew Luck's five game winning drives in the fourth or OT are tied with Ben Roethlisberger and Vince Young for the most by a rookie since the AFL-NFL merger of 1970. In those five game-winning drives, he's accounted for 83% of his team's total yards with three touchdown passes. You want more on those drives? I got more on those drives. Here they are. What about week two? Minnesota ties it up with 30 ticks left, and Luck drives the Colts 45 yards in 20 seconds. It's nice to know Adam Vinatieri can still bang through a 53-yarder for the win. Week five, after the Packers have taken the lead with less than five to go on the clock, Luck, 8 of 11 for 80 yards on the final drive, including that great job by Reggie Wayne for the four-yard touchdown pass to stretch it over the plane. And then week eight against the Titans, 
This will always be remembered as the Vic Ballard play, but it was an 80 yard drive on the first possession, culminating with that 16 yard acrobatic touchdown. Another rookie, by the way, one week later against the Dolphins. Luck leads the Colts on a 13 play drive, chewing up more than seven minutes, leading to a Adam Vinatieri 43 yarder for the game winner. And then again on Sunday, Luck pulled off his biggest stunner yet with this to Donnie Avery with no time remaining to complete Indy's fourth quarter comeback. Five drives of his eight wins, fourth quarter or overtime game winning variety. What does that tell you about him? Well, listen, he's got immense poise in, you know, when I think the game's not too fast for him. When you see guys, you know, excelling late in games when everything is frantic, you know, you're hurrying up to get the ball snapped, you're trying to read the coverage, trying to do everything right. When he's able to slow everything down in those moments, I think that's what jumps out at me the most, just his command of the situation. And the other thing you see is he moves around better in the pocket than I think people give him credit for. On both those plays that we saw on the highlight, he's under pressure, he's able to move to his left, extend the play, throw it down the field. He's off balance, under pressure as he makes the throw. And in the last play, he, he, there's pressure, he gets out of the pocket, he has the awareness of line of scrimmage, and he gets the ball off there. So let's take a look and take us beyond the play here. Okay, so this is going to be a sail route, two outside breaking routes with a fade. Detroit's in a cover two defense. As Luck comes back, he's under pressure. He's got to push out to his left. Now he starts to roll his left. Delmas jumps Reggie Wayne. So right here, Drayton Florence thinks that he's going to have help over the top, but he doesn't. LeVon Brazil is able to get behind him. Look how upright Andrew Luck is. He gets hit as he throws, and he throws it 50 oh. yards down the field. That's not the technique you're looking for from your quarterback, but it's the presence that you're looking for and it, the arm strength on that play with that technique. You can appreciate it more Listen, than that. That's, that's a freakish type throw at, at that stage, too. So it's uh, listen, very few deficiencies that you can find in this guy's game. Uh, you could say the same for another quarterback that was not taken in the first round playing in the great Northwest. That would be Russell Wilson. Listen, everybody knows the Seahawks are great at home, but could they get a signature road win? They had won against Carolina but now they're facing the Bears in Chicago fourth quarter in about two minutes left second and ten Wilson can't find anyone and, and this is what you notice now is Russell Wilson knows when to run and knows when to throw yeah, and he does such a good job of also maintaining his you know possibility as a passer but then knowing when he needs to take off with the football and there's the pass to Golden Tate and give Golden Tate all the credit in the world here for the unbelievable effort to get into the end zone Bears were basically tied up, so we went to overtime. Seahawks with the ball first in OT. It's third and four. Third and four, and again, showing that ability to make plays with his legs. And then first and ten from the Seahawks on the 13-yard line. Gives Sidney Rice all the effort in the world here for cashing this one in. Yeah, he does a great job of pushing the defender off, coming across the field, then holding out of the ball as he takes that hit. Seven and five they are now with their second road win, 23-17. If you go by total QBR, no other quarterback had a better fourth quarter and overtime performance in week 13 than Wilson. He posted a QBR of 98.4 out of a possible 100, completing 10 of 14 passes for 118 yards and two touchdowns. He also had a game high 66 yards rushing in the fourth quarter and in overtime. And when you look at the maturation of Russell Wilson as a player, because when you talked to him when he was drafted, you felt like you were talking to a, a senator or a congressman. He just had that sort of leadership about him. But his ability to get better on the road, he really struggled in his first few road games. He has gotten significantly better as this season has gone on. Maybe better leadership than a senator right. or a congressman. To Separate be issue entirely. <laughs> well, listen, I think when you look at this guy, he's developed as a passer inside the pocket. And there are a bunch of things on display when you look at his performance on the road. It's the on-time passing, inside the pocket, throwing in rhythm the design of the play. Third and four, and you're backed up. Not the time to be trying to create offense and having a play that leads to a turnover or taking a negative play. You see him, one, two, three, ball comes out. It's accurate in the chest of Golden Tate in between Lance Briggs and Tim Jennings, which allows Golden Tate to run after the catch. And that's a big play on a very short throw because he's operating in the confines of the offense. Now, his ability to be a design runner. Watch him here, off of a little run action to Marshawn Lynch. That's going to move the linebackers, which is going to help the, the Seattle Seahawks offense get angles to get the perimeter blocked for Russell Wilson. And we've seen this. The guy's a very athletic player, but he also knows when to get down and how to protect his body. You see that there as a designed runner. Now the scramble ability. We saw this in the highlight tray coming off the play action fake. Doesn't like the route as it tries to define itself. Gets into the open field 
and he makes Brian Erlacher look silly in the open field. And I know Erlacher is playing on a bad wheel, but that's no contest. This guy is operating at the quarterback position at an extremely high level in a bunch of different areas. That's impressive. Yeah, the most impressive thing to me is this is his fourth straight game with no interceptions, and even as he scrambles around, he's not taking unnecessary risks. Okay, now Seahawks corner Richard Sherman, who is never shy. You mad, bro? He tweeted <laughs> after Tom Brady says that he thinks Wilson is better than RG3 and Andrew Luck. Agree or disagree? Listen, his numbers are comparable, and if we're going to talk about Rookie of the Year conversation, he needs to be in the conversation. I don't think there's been anybody better than Andrew Luck, um, but his name deserves to be in the mix based on how he's played, how he's protected the football. Yeah, I agree. His name deserves to be in the mix, and especially when you consider where he was drafted versus yeah. those other two guys, the fact that he won the spot and he's done as well as he has. Nobody expected that. Production per dollar? Yeah. It, yeah. It, or, or, Value? So, so not, yes, not, yes. not pound for pound? Oh, not pound for pound. Production yes. per dollar. <laughs> and by the way, three of their final four games are at home where they have yet to lose this season. So it could be setting up very nicely for a finish for the Seattle Seahawks in the great Northwest. All right, when we continue, Seahawks trying to get that playoff spot. We already have four teams in the postseason, one-third of the playoff picture complete. But of those that are already in, which team might be the most vulnerable? Beyond the Play is brought to you by Xbox. Watch and interact with thousands of live games, including Monday Night Football, with ESPN on Xbox 360. Experience why sports are more amazing with Xbox. Robert Griffin the third, six to six on the Redskins' first possession. He fires downfield, he's now seven for seven as Garcon breaks free. Pierre Garcon will not be caught. 88 yards to number 88 for the first touchdown of RG3's NFL career. Pressure in his face, can't follow through. That, that's fantastic. And he has a great seat in the house to watch the play unfold. On the way by Akers, line drive kick is gonna get there. Hits the yeah. front bar, and it is good. And off the Reggie break, tackle after tackle, touchdown, Reggie oh, Bush. Touchdown, Titus Young. He caught it at the one and dove in. Love to the end zone. Fumble by Tate with Jennings simultaneous. Who has it? Touchdown! Oh my God, he's got it. Touchdown, Seahawks. He's gonna gun it deep. White's there with Nakamura. Oh, it's caught. Touchdown. RG3 electrifying RG3 for the touchdown. Can you believe it? Manning fires. Stokely went up. What a throw. What a catch. What a comeback. Sanchez is back to throw. And a fumble on the play. Patriots recover. The game is over. For Bryant, the ball is caught for a touchdown. You have to make the plays when they're there. A lot of these games come down to these kinds of situations. At the end of that ball game, it didn't work out this time. Welcome back to NFL Live, presented by Xbox. What to watch for tonight? The Giants seek their fourth season sweep of the Redskins in the past five years, but they will have to contain RG3, who comes in as the first rookie ever to toss four touchdown passes in consecutive games. Coverage begins with Monday Night Countdown at 6.30 Eastern. Actually, think about it. The coverage begins right now with a DirecTV team report from Lisa Salters. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Trey. Well, it looks like Mike Shanahan has discovered yet another running back gem in sixth-round rookie Alfred Morris out of Florida Atlantic University. In 1995, Shanahan and the Denver Broncos drafted a then unheralded Terrell Davis in the same round. Through 11 games, Morris has become the fifth best rusher in the league and needs just 18 yards to reach 1,000 on the season. When we asked Shanahan what he saw in Morris, he said, one thing all the great running backs do is they make the first guy miss. He said nobody tackles Alfred in the open field, and once he's got a guy one-on-one, -on -one, I've never seen anybody tackle him. Trey? Tyler. 
All right, Lisa, thanks so much. Give me the keys to the game tonight. Well, I think the big key for the Giants is to be able to control that run game that the Washington Redskins have. Everything they do comes off that run game with Alfred Morris. The design quarterback runs, the play action passing. They need to do a good job of stopping that to stop the rest of that offense. Yeah, I think it really comes down to big plays. And, and RG3 leads the NFL in touchdown passes of over 25 yards. And we saw it against Dallas. We saw it against Philadelphia. Even if it's not scoring, he's having these dramatic field position changing yeah. plays that, that completely uh, alter the outcome and, and, and alter the, the, the scope of the game. And Justin Texas, they take away your will to play the game. <laughs> we'll see how enthusiastic he is after four quarters once again of taking care or trying to get after RG3. Well, uh, they took care of business in Denver. The Denver Broncos and Peyton Manning, salute, have won the AFC West in back-to-back -back years thanks in a large part to Peyton's 27-38 Passing day for 242 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. Again, the first back-to-back -back AFC West titles since 86 and 87 as they won 31 to 23. Really, about a six-minute period in the third quarter swung this game. Broncos, one of four teams to clinch a playoff spot week 13. They get the West. The Patriots wrap up the AFC East for the ninth time in the past 10 years. So if you're the Patriots, 90% of the last decade, you're champs. The Falcons clinched the NFC South. The Texans amazingly tied with the Falcons for the best record in football, but have yet to clinch their division, but they have clinched a playoff spot. So listen, this is one third of the playoff picture. We still have two thirds to be completed. That's math. But of these four teams that are in, Tim, give me the team you think that just might be the most vulnerable in the postseason. Well, I think it's the Atlanta Falcons. We've seen them play a bunch of close games this year, which, which gives people – uh, you know, ideas and designs to try to attack this football team in terms of areas that they've struggled. And I think the other aspect of it is that they've struggled in the postseason. And Matt Ryan in that Atlanta Falcons team is going to have so much pressure, so much attention on them in the postseason. And I think that that can be debilitating to some teams depending on how they handle that. And so, listen, they're a very good football team. I'm not predicting them to lose. But they, to me, out of these four teams, look the most vulnerable. Yeah, originally I was going to say the Patriots because of the struggles that they've had defensively. But in the last six uh, weeks in their six-game uh, winning streak, they've improved in almost every category. So I agree with you. It's the Atlanta Falcons. And, and the reason for me is the close games, but it's also the 29th in rush average and 29th in rush average defensively. They, they haven't been able to fix that. They haven't been able to address that. And I think when you get in the playoffs, the best way to uh, control an explosive offense is to keep them off the field, and, and that's the other team running the ball. And I think the Falcons all know that, listen, all this is great, but we've been down this road before yeah. with the Falcons. They were the number one seed a couple of years ago. Their offense got shut out last year by the Giants. They only got a safety in that playoff loss. They have never, as this team has been currently constructed with Matt Ryan, Thomas Dimitrov, the general manager, and Mike Smith, won a playoff game. There is that added pressure. We'll see if they can get that done. Meanwhile, in Foles, they trust is the attitude in Philadelphia. Nick Foles will be the starter for the rest of the season. Andy Reid making that announcement today. Made his third straight start Sunday night. Lost his third straight start. But the rookie out of Arizona will be their starter for the rest of the season. That according to Andy Reid. All right, for the very latest on this, uh, let's bring in ESPN insider Adam Schefter from the NFL 32 set. Adam, is this an indication, I talked about this with the guys earlier, that this might have been the end of the Michael Vick era? I think absolutely, Trey. You look at Michael Vick's contract. It was constructed in a way so that the Eagles could release him after the Super Bowl without any financial obligation to him on their salary cap for next season. Plus, they want to see what Nick Foles can do after last night in the final four games of the season so they know how much they have to rely on him for next season. So it is certainly possible that Michael Vick has played his last down in Philadelphia, and we do know that Eagles defensive line coach Jim Washburn is done coaching there. The team fired him in the parking lot of the airport after they arrived home earlier this morning from their loss in Dallas. Well, it just is a lost season, and that continues to be a part of it in Philadelphia. What about the potential losses of Seahawks cornerbacks Richard Sermon and Brandon Browner? They're waiting for their appeal of a four-game suspension for testing positive uh, for Adderall. There's only four games left in the regular season, Adam. What more can you tell us? Richard Sherman's appeal is not going to be heard until Friday, December 14th, which means, Trey, that he's going to play Sunday against Arizona and the possible appearance of the Seahawks in the playoffs, it's possible they could be without Richard Sherman if he does not win his appeal on December 14th. Brandon Browner still undetermined on the day for him at this particular time. All right, Adam, then we have more news surrounding Indomitian Sioux taking some more heat. Apparently some of the Colts said 
that he and some other Lions they felt were laughing and joking about Winston Justice, the offensive lineman, when he was concussed. Obviously, we saw what happened uh, where Ndamukong Sue was fined on Thanksgiving Day. We actually had the same sort of chatter from the Falcons last season talking about some of the Lions players, telling them to go get the cart, get this guy off the field. What more can you tell us here? Exact same story one year later, Trey. As you mentioned, it happened with the Falcons last October in 2011. It happened yesterday. The Lions said that essentially, or the Colts said that Ndamukong Sue stood over Winston Justice, who suffered the concussion, and was celebrating and taunting and dancing. NFL officiating is going to review the play. The Colts will probably send in more plays. Then if the league determines that there's any potential discipline there, they'll send it over to Merton Hanks for him to review. It's premature to say that any discipline will come out of this, but clearly the league is going to look into it to see if there's anything that warrants any discipline. Adam Schefter from the NFL 32 set always cerebral. We appreciate Thank you, the information. When we continue here on this edition of NFL, it is the best five minutes of Eric Mangini's week. We simply call it Overreaction Monday. Coach, you love it. You love it. Love it. We're focusing on you right now because we know you love it. Thursday Night Football, live on ESPN America. We're straight into Oakland for an AFC West rivalry. The fierce Raider Nation have had little to cheer, but that won't stop them giving Manning a hostile reception as they look to upset Denver. Broncos and Raiders, Thursday at 0200 CET, live on ESPN America. When I first came out here, I, I could barely breathe for, for maybe a month. The effect is... is it's pretty brutal. Like you can run one or two plays and feel like you don't ran 10 plays. They can't breathe. During warm-ups, during those first few series of the game, you definitely feel the altitude in your lungs. You, you will not be able to breathe. If somebody makes him mad, he's going to put every ounce of man muscle on the back of your frame. As a coach, can't tolerate this behavior. But I know what I did, and the man upstairs knows what I did. A little immature as a football team. I heard that we were one-trick pony. Well, if we are one-trick pony, that's one hell of a trick. The party and says, you know what? I could be like the villain. Not a good idea to make him mad. NCAA is a place where stars are born. A chance to catch the legends of tomorrow today. And with ESPN America's complete coverage from the regular season through to March Madness and the Final Four, you won't need to wait long for the next big thing. College basketball all season long on ESPN America. You know, a guy that may very well be the end up 10 years from now being that conversation is the greatest ever. There's he's, nothing he's he eight can't, and four. There's yeah. nothing he can't do. We'd like to personally thank our friend Trent <laughs> Dilfer for setting us up perfectly for this oh. segment we like to call Overreaction Monday. Thanks, Trent. Keep doing what you're doing. Are you guys ready? Ready. Let's ready. start. Let's just jump on the Trent Dilfer fire that he started. Andrew Luck is not rookie of the year. He's MVP of the league. He's not the MVP of the league. This is an overreaction. He's been fantastic. I'm sure he'll get a couple of votes, but to me, I, I think that Peyton Manning would be the MVP of the league. Tom Brady in that conversation. So, yeah, I'm, the guy's throwing almost as many interceptions as touchdowns. So that's a little much for me. That's what I was saying. He's got 17 touchdowns and 16 interceptions, and he's done a great job. But you can't deny what Peyton Manning's done. Look at a guy like Adrian Peterson, Tom Brady. I think it's a little too early for that. That's why it's the prime Tim dime. Yeah. Okay, how about this one? He's Greg McElroy. <laughs> Greg McElroy is the Jets' future at quarterback. <clears throat> this is an overreaction. He, look, he did a nice job sparking the football team on Sunday. Uh, I don't believe he has the skill set, to be honest, to, to be a starter in the National Football League, and that's why this is a major overreaction. Yeah, this is the first game he's been active as an NFL player, and, and he only played a quarter. And he, granted, he, he did a nice job with the one mm -hmm. touchdown drive, 
but I think we're a little too early here as well. Yes. So he's got uh, a smile out of about, uh, Wait, uh, I think uh, he's buying into the concept. <laughs> so you're saying in one quarter and a half in the first game enough. where he's been active, it yeah. wasn't enough? Probably not enough right now. <laughs> got it. All right. I'm going on a limb. All right. What, what, what's next on the bandwagon here? What are we doing? AP, Adrian Peterson is better after reconstructive knee surgery than before it. Yeah, we, we had this one earlier in the season, and I said that that was an overreaction, and I'm saying it's not an overreaction at this point. The guy has been unbelievable. Remember before the injury, he dealt with fumbling issues? He doesn't have fumbling issues anymore. This guy, I think he is. I think he's better than, than before the injury. Yeah, this is not an overreaction. The guy's average, I think, 6.0 was his lowest over the last six games, and as high as 10.7 yeah, yards, yeah, yards, 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 per yards, per yards, yards per carry. It, it's ridiculous the things that he's doing, the way that he's breaking tackles. This is not an overreaction. Put this in perspective. His current season record or season pace of yards per carry and yards per game higher than at any point in his yeah. career, and he shredded his knee Christmas Eve a year ago. It's amazing. See, Trent, this makes sense. Okay, now let's move on. We, we also went to social media, and this one from Twitter. The Steelers having beaten the Ravens, they're Super Bowl bound, baby. Overreaction? That's an overreaction. This is a great win by that football team with their third string quarterback, uh, but this is an overreaction. I think, I mean, look, you look at the AFC. We talked about some of the teams, whether it's the New England Patriots or whether it's uh, the Denver Broncos, other good teams. So nice win, but that's an overreaction. Yeah, it was a great win, but I think it says that the Baltimore defense still has a yeah. little bit more work to do, uh, especially when you consider what Cleveland did the week before. Uh, nice win, but I, I don't think it means much more than that. Well, of course, uh, Pittsburgh did help Cleveland with eight turnovers yeah, in, yeah, that, in, in that game. But by the way, they did end the 16-game home winning streak by the Ravens. But here's the best thing about the Steelers-Ravens. It's always going to be a good game. Seven of the last eight Ravens-Steelers games decided by exactly three points. Uh, that game, you could say, was a standout. Speaking of that, it's a Monday mainstay coming up on NFL Live. Sunday standouts just ahead. You are watching NFL Live, presented by Xbox. This December on ESPN America, the festivities are here and you'll have plenty to cheer. With the playoffs just around the corner, it's crunch time in the NFL. And it's all about bowl games as the college football season nears its close. And we stay on campus as the top teams in college basketball go head to head. The brightest stars, the biggest games, all this month, live on ESPN America. Can you believe how much smarter you are this year? Man, that's, no, that's, that's amazing. amazing. Right. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Time out. Time out. You get with them, and then you tell them. Right? That's your team. Right there. All right, all right. Look, we take care of it, right? But it ain't helping you talking to him about something you got a problem with that guy over there. Go see him. You need to get it out in the open, you know? Best way to air something out is getting it out in the open. All we got to do is talk about it. H5, sister two, Scott. Fade. Fade, Y over Shaw. X yellow. Got it all down? Got a lot of information down. H5, 62, Scott, fade, Y over X shallow. On one. On one. Ready? Winning is not a sometime thing, it's an all the time thing. You don't win once in a while, and you don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is a habit. Vinny could go from here up to blind rage in 10 seconds and then back down. There was nothing in between. And once when we a piece about the dressing room and the light. Or electrician with power. Place and that's first place. Second. Second. Again. Four. on 
this because this is a work it's a desire to get in the end zone look at Pete with his hands up he knows it's going to be a touchdown yeah it's vintage very sad Brought to you by, by Go to Thing that's always said is, man, you're fast. And, uh, you know, I like to think uh, sometimes we utilize, sometimes we don't. Uh, but it's, it's good when the team knows something's coming with it. Well, RG3 has been Time payoff question: Which total will be higher, guys? Eli passing yards or RG's total yards? Kim, you know, it's a lot, and I really think. Have that you really thought RG about it a lot? a lot? We believe yeah. it, Trey. We believe it. It will be RG nine yards. That's just an answer here. Trey. I don't believe it. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so Eli Manning has 350. Well, again, it was a big play from Eli that sealed the win, the 77-yard touchdown to against the Redskins. Eli Manning, only two touchdowns and eight interceptions. I was studying your notes. There you go. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, now we have a time for Sunday standouts, ladies and gentlemen. You guys ready? Yep, ready. Uh, let's go with best pass, and Ooh. I think we're going to go with the, uh, what, the 26-yard yes. handoff to yeah, Reggie Wayne. You know, <laughs> what you do on third and one that you pointed out. I mean, look at this. Yeah, oh right in gosh. between three defenders, right on his hands, and that's well done. How about the best run? All hail the great Adrian Peterson. This is Adrian Peterson. This is his career high. Breaking tackle. But the funny thing about this is it's the same run that he keeps hitting on everybody. Same formation, same play, same side of the field. He just breaks tackles with guys with different colors. You know, it's it's amazing what he's doing. That's Adrian Peterson of the Palestine Petersons doing very, <laughs> very well. 210 yard dressing. Best effort, got to give it to Golden Tate. There would be Golden Notre Tate. Notre Dame had a good Bears. weekend. They did. Let's not talk about that, but we can talk about it. We can talk about Golden Tate here. Great effort. And listen, we know the Bears are a good tackling group on defense. Sure they are. That's an excellent effort. Good job protecting the football as well as you reach over the goal line. All right, best one-handed catch. Yeah, this is Kyle Rudolph. Again, Notre Dame had a good weekend. Yeah, not bad. You can see him reach back here, grabs it with his, with his left hand, is able to bring it in, concentrate as he's got the defender, wrapping him up, making the tackle. Just really nice awareness of where the football is and his ability to finish the play. Best catch by a line, it's got to be Tony Sheffler. Oh, it has to be Tony Sheffler. Look at this, work in the sideline. First of all, it's Don't a tap. throw, but then understanding where you are in the field. For a tight end that far down the field, that's... That's outstanding by Tony Sheffler. Oh, wait, no, wait. We have a better catch by a line. His name is Megatron. Yeah, this, this is almost oh, a little, It's a little unfair to be in uh, man coverage out here with no help. Way he just reaches out in front. He's got such width and winning span, strength. It's hard for anybody to handle. Yeah, there's not a coaching point, Terry. Yeah, sorry, no, Tony. Understand. You just got Megatron. Okay, uh, 
How about the best catch by someone sitting down? Oh, that would have to be no Sean Marino. I mean, listen, on a crucial third down yes, play, yes. look at how great this is. One by Peyton Manning. The throw is outstanding because you have to throw it to the ground. <laughs> but then no Sean Marino. Even Greg Schiano liked it. If he likes something, it has to be pretty good. All right, best catch by a non-NFL player. Yeah, what I like about this is what's a sound guy as he lowers, I don't even know what that's called. A parabolic mic. Yeah, the parabolic mic. It really good awareness because he didn't want to get hit there in the uh, lower part of his body. So he, you know what? I really could have mentioned. I could have called that the flux capacitor because you didn't know what <laughs> yeah, you would have said. I would have gone with it. Yeah. Well, like Mike. Uh, best defensive play, Patrick Peterson of the Arizona Glendale Peterson. Yes, it is the Glendale Petersons, and this is an outstanding play. It's actually a pretty well thrown ball by Mark Sanchez, but Peterson goes up and fights for the football more than the receiver does. It's excellent. How about the best walk-off TD and, and paying, a, paying a price for it, Sidney Rice? Yeah, really nice job off the play action. The boot is able to take the linebacker up, create space against the defensive back, and then is able to hold on to it, takes this hit. Really, uh, really impressive. And that's the problem when you try and judge it. You weren't trying to do it like that. Right. It just happened. But the best reaction, this hug between Ben Roethlisberger and Charlie Bass. Yeah, and usually as a player, you never know when your last game as a player would be. But as a quarterback, it's even a little bit more difficult knowing when your last start will be. That's clearly the emotions there for Charlie Batch. And you can see a lot of guys happy for him. You know, moments like that, it's why you love sports. Yeah. It's why specifically you love football because it's such a team game and the camaraderie and the bond that Ben had with Charlie there. It's a 15-year veteran. He'll probably never start again. And probably never thought he would have that opportunity. Exactly. And to close out that game, eight straight completed passes to finish that game. Way to go, Charlie Batch. Get something done there. Ending the Ravens' 16-game home winning streak in the process. We got more here on NFL Live, including the very best of the very best. You've seen it, and you will hear it with the sounds of the weekend just ahead. This is your not so fast. That's game, right. right? Yeah. Not so fast, my friend. Not so fast. Ah, not so fast. <laughs> Arizona State in a not so fast, my friend. Not so fast, my friend. <laughs> oh. Nobody remembers I was a coach. Now. I don't even think I'm a pencil salesman. The black Dixon number two pencil is going to kill him. Lieutenant Colonel, not so fast. Not so fast. Delayed. Not so fast. Rocky Top. Not so fast. College game day, all season on ESPN America. No, his hair. Very red. <laughs> I don't know why. People call him the Red Rifle. The Red Rifle hooks up with A.J. Green. It's red, man, but yeah, there's nothing he can do about that. I would say a darker orange than it would be red. And he got some weird hair, you know. He's just red, it's, but it's not like bright red. It's like a burnt orange. Orange does look good. <laughs> you know what I think about any dog hair? It is so pretty. It is so pretty. The Red Rifle. It's made for Cincinnati because his hair color it almost matched our orange. It looks good on him. It fits his personality. It do look funny. It shows fire, his passion. It's a nice little clean cut fade. Oh, this would be like white and pale and then everything else would just be gray. <laughs> the best player is out of uh, three guys. The talking really has to do with your pads. They're in our way. When I'm running, you kind of let instinct take over and you have to trust it. Showtime! Arian Foster! Rock and roll! Touchdown! Arian Foster! Touchdown! Ray Rice! Pushes the pile! Touchdown! In for the touchdown! Shady McCoy explodes again! Only Shady McCoy can make that play. Left side, big hole! Touchdown, Ravens! 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Arian Foster, my goodness! I love to fly. I love all forms of flying. I still get a big thrill out of it, and the sky is still my office. It always has been for the last 63 years, and I look forward to flying as soon as I can again. I had a wonderful and interesting career in the United States Air Force. I was a test pilot. I was a fighter pilot. I was a parachutist. We hadn't gone into space yet. The two objectives were, one, how to work in space, and two, how to provide a means of escape from high altitude. Our beginning goal was to jump from 100,000 feet.
the Excelsior, the purpose of that, we had never gone into space. We knew that we'd have to get outside the spacecraft and work. No one had ever gone that high in a balloon. I was going to a new frontier. At 20,000 feet, I fell into the clouds. I'd never gone into clouds before. So I checked my altimeter two or three times to make doggone certain I was, knew where I was. I free fell for four minutes and 36 seconds. NFL Live is presented by Xbox. This holiday, get an Xbox 360 with Connect and three games, now $50 off. And in part by Best Buy. Make sure you check out NFL 32 at its new time, Monday through Friday, 5 o'clock Eastern on ESPN2, where you will get information on all 32 teams. NFL 32 each weeknight, 5 Eastern on ESPN2. How about the sounds of the weekend in the NFL Week 13? Sanchez dropped the throw. Looks right. Throws one up the seam and it's intercepted. The Jets have no choice. There's going to be a quarterback change. McElroy. Play action. End zone. Touchdown. I've seen enough and it's, it's time to make that change. Adrian turns the corner at the 21st down. Breaks the tackle at the 25. Breaks another at the 30. And he's loose. Pass to the right. It's a screen pass to Welker. He's going to go to the end zone. Standing up. Touchdown. Every single play was a, was a challenge. And, uh, you know, we made some plays when we needed to. Kick is on its way. Plenty of leg. It is. I'll let you know if there's a change, but right now I think, you know, feel this will be the same as it was this week. Wilson. Oh, the dart right! In the end zone! Touchdown! Seahawks! Beat Chicago, you know, here at Soldier Field in front of all these people. That's big for us. Left. Dumps it up to Donnie Avery! Yeah! To the flag! Goal line! Touchdown! Colts win! Thankful to be on a team that just that just keeps playing. Brady Quinn firing in late over the middle. It's caught! Tony Moyaki! We play and coach on Sunday. And so that's why I wanted to play the game. I think this team was able to take an event and uh, allow it to redefine us as a team. Why don't we give out game balls for week 13? How about Tony Romo? 300 yards, three touchdowns, and no interceptions. Again, passing Troy Aikman for the most touchdown passes in Cowboy franchise history. Adrian Peterson, his team may have lost, but again, 210 yards on the ground. Give it up for the Bengals' D, by the way. Carlos Dunlop, two sacks, two forced fumbles, and a fumble recovery as they won four straight. Look out for Cincinnati. Uh, they got mojo right now. Who has mojo tonight? Well, I think the Giants have the mojo tonight. I think Eli continues to play well, and I think that defense does a better job second time around. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with uh, RG3 and the Redskins. I think he does a better job the second time around. Mm. Second exposure to their defense. They're going to do a little bit more, and it's probably going to come down to the big plays. I, I don't know. He did pretty good the first time around against him. I know, and now he knows the personnel that much better. They can do that much more in terms of attacking him defensively. I give them the edge. History says it's the Giants. Since 2008 in this series, it's right since 2008 in this series, whoever won the first meeting has won the second meeting. All right, so the Giants won the first one. So if that trend continues, that means it will be the Giants tonight on ESPN's Monday Night Football. That's it for this edition of NFL Live. But don't forget, 5 o'clock on ESPN2, NFL 32. Wendy Nix, what do you got? Coming up, Trey or Tom Brady and Peyton Manning destined to square off in the AFC Championship game. We'll talk about that. Bills running back C.J. Spiller joins us, and I'm joined by two former teammates on two different teams. Antonio Pierce and Tim Hasselbeck are here on ESPN2 for another full hour of NFL News.